Uh, today um, we have uh, Yasmin uh, Sari, who is a candidate or a finished candidate for the PhD at PhD. Um, finishing very soon <laughs> in the Department of Philosophy at the University of Alberta in Canada. Um, her dissertation is on Heidegger and Arendt. It's called Heidegger versus Arendt: A Recognitive Politics of Nonviolence and Invisibility. With lots of funny markings in between, so <laughs> you have to read it to, to actually understand what it says. Um, and then her paper today is part of that project. I, I imagine I don't know if it's an actual chapter or a standalone paper. Which, both. Both. Yeah. Uh, it's called an Arendtian Recognitive Politics: The Right to Have Rights as a Performance of Visibility. So she'll talk for, I think the per paper was circulated, I hope, um, if you RSVP'd. Uh, she'll talk for 10 minutes, is that about right? Yeah. And then we'll have a conversation. Great. Yeah. Um, well, thank you, Roger, and I thank everyone for being here. And I should say that it's been a slice. It's been three weeks now since I'm here. I already feel like I've been here forever. Uh, <laughs> so thank you for welcoming me. And this is usually the part at which I explain what I work on, who I work on, who Arendt is, and what she did, why she did it. Obviously for this audience that will not be necessary, but still, as is commonly understood or can be commonly accepted, everybody has a Hannah Arendt, like everybody has their different Arendt, so to speak. And I just want to explain the stake for me in, this, in doing this project, so to speak. So the notion for me that is very, has been very important in my work is uh, the notion of responsibility and in connection to freedom. But responsibility is literally understood in the sense of being able to respond, uh, which comes up in the sense of um, commitment to the world, commitment to the space that we share with others and how we interact with others. Um, and this notion of responsibility, I think, is very much connected with the notion of equality. And we'll understand what equality is or what it was for Arendt and for other people or in the declaration, so to speak. But if we try to understand responsibility through equality, we can see that an equal responsibility or equality and responsibility does not always hold. Because equal, there is no equal ability to respond amongst different individuals, so to speak. And some people cannot, I think there's a lack of ability of responding, and this may, I will try to show that this may be due to some sort of non or misrecognition. Uh, and the other one is that people just do not, simply do not will to respond. And for that, I don't think we have an imperative, or I don't know if we can have an imperative. Uh, so the purpose of this paper, it's a paper that tackles the question of equality and the similar grounding that I find in Marx's and Arendt's um, critiques of human rights and the, universe, the, the demand for universal equality found in the declarations uh, to put forth that there is, a, that there is an understanding that Arendt gives us of, uh, of the artificial equality which must be constructed by way of speech and action, so to speak, or recognition. And we can discuss how this sort of artificial equality presents itself. Uh, we'll talk about the membership to a community, or if we may like, you know, organized community, and we can discuss what organized means in this sense, because I'm trying to put forth a, a, a distinction between social and political spaces, so to speak, um, in this paper. But, yeah, so I wanted to just show, first of all, that's why it starts with Marx, a long, you know, a long analysis of Marx's critique, because I think they're on a similar footing when it comes to criticizing uh, the, the, the rights discourse found in the, the human rights uh, declarations. Uh, so for Marx, the idea stems for, from, uh, from the Declaration of uh, 1793, which he takes to show the inherent inequality found in the uh, in Article Three of the of the Declaration, which says all men are equal by nature and before the law. So. And it also, cons it also further states, the 1795 Declaration further states that equality consists in the law being the same for all, whether it protects or punishes. Um, so the, this article, this Article 3, operates um, at a level of a two-sided factuality, if you like. And the first is that the human being, the natural human being, the non-citizen, is equal to every other in this natural capacity. And second, that the citizen, understood as the rights bearer, is equal to every other before the law, 
however, this time only in and through the capacity of the state and its authority to recognize the rights bearer as worthy of these rights as such. So there are two levels. There, well, I say there's a two level of factuality, but you can take it as norm and fact as well. Um, what Marx finds in this in in this um, article to the problematic is then again the inherent inequality, which is based on the sort of split person that we can that we find in this proposition. So the person, the natural person, as um, having or possessing the rights of men. Uh, the life, liberty, if you like, happiness, but the way in which he calls it, life, liberty, security, and equality are the rights of men, which belong to, for him, to the egoistic individual in their capacity to um, utilize or to, um, so to speak, practice certain means to their own ends. So it becomes instrumental and individualistic in trying to satisfy these ends. Whereas the rights of the citizen, which in the, in the, um, text uh, at hand, which is on the Jewish question, it is about freedom of religion, and you can put in freedom of association, and if you like, freedom of speech for us right now. These are the juridical political rights which pertain to the abstract citizen or the citoyen, um, which is supposed to be the true universal human being uh, found in the state. So the problem for Marx is that the, the way in which the true human, the true universal human being understood as the citizen, as having these rights, does not really show us the tension, or does not so sort of covers over the tension that we find between the split person or the split individual, so to speak. Um, so the political rights of the citizen he contends are actually like they rest on the rights of the social, economic, and individual human being, which are confined to the private interests and private capris of the human being as she's separated from the community. So Marx understands um, the rights of the citizen, the so-called political rights, to be internally tied to the rights that are exercised by the human being through the rights of men. And herein lies the internal conflict of the individual, for one, as a rights-bearing and human being, an individual's rights extend to the arbitrary free choices in her private social life, uh, which in turn determine her socioeconomic relations with other individuals, while too, as the public citizen, her ends are to be understood to be in harmony with the universal laws purported by the state. And this is the point at which the assumption of universal equality presents an internal tension in its articulation. So the instrumentality, like, or the instrumentality is the principle upon which the socioeconomic relationships between individual human beings in civil society rest, and the individual has a right to pursue her instrumental ends, insofar as they do not infringe upon another's rights. Space of freedom, that is a free transaction, actually, as he puts it. It's the freedom to buy, sell, and to exploit. Um, the, yeah, it's not novel for the students of Marx, obviously. So what's happening here is that the, the critique holds water. It is, I think Nancy Fraser once called it, it's an unsurpassable, unsurpassable critique of liberal rights, and I totally agree with that. Uh, but the way in which Marx understands, and this is the distinction between, I think, Marx and Arendt, the way in which she understands political is basically resting on the notion of domination and ruling. So the, while he does an amazing job about how to differentiate between political and you know, social or like, universal rights, the way in which we can understand recognition in his context becomes very individualistic. So what happens is that in the background, he criticizes the Hobbesian in McPherson's words, like the possessive individualist person who is just trying to pertain their ends. But he only sees, in criticizing this, he does not see the political or the truly universal human being to be capable of a public personality or public personhood. So the problem emerges when the self-recognition of the citizen, so he will call this like, I need to, or like the, the individual person has to recognize the abstract, abstract citizen in themselves and become a truly social and universal human being. But this problem is that, the problem is that through true human emancipation, uh, which surpasses the political emancipation of the human being, puts her in opposition to her natural self in society. So this is a valuable insight for one, but it doesn't sufficiently explain the relationship between the process of recognition and human rights understood in a public sense. 
So for Marx to recap and then go on to our end, uh, one only needs to have self-recognition, recognizing the citizen and the natural human being, in order to be recognized in public. And this self-recognition is the condition of a truly self-making subject who is sovereign to her actions. And at this point we can also point out or remind ourselves that Marx is still coming from a sort of enlightenment tradition where freedom for him was uh, understood as rational self-determination. So because of the conditions under the capitalist mode of production, so to speak, which seem to affirm some sort of equality and freedom, we can see that this was not the case because we don't have the sort of social equal setting. Um, and if I'm not sovereign to my actions or my ends, like the outcomes of my actions, then I'm, I cannot be understood, understood to be genuinely free for Marx. So for Marx, this is where the human being's true universal equality lies in their universal capacity to produce and express themselves. It's also a very productive and objectifying um, sort of understanding of self-making. Um, the <coughs> problem, however, is that the self-producing or self-making subject remains at an individualistic level, where the, where the subject does not need to appear as a worldly being, as one who appears to others. And while it, what is at stake here is the freedom of a self-making subject, whose recognition by others does not seem to play a role in this freedom. So equality can be understood, like we cannot understand equality in the way in which they're given to us by the declarations, but it will have to be understood in this sort of universal, almost metaphysical or anthropological notion of human being who can produce uh, non-coercively or in a non coerced fashion. So the point coming to like the, the Arendtian side of this is that, the, or like coming to Arendt, like how do we understand Arendt now, is that we, we need to have still, even though the declarations or the certain articles about the universal quality of human beings uh, rest on a problem or a tension on a poria, as she'll call it, we still want to understand some sort of equality. And this will be, uh, the way in which we can understand this will be by way of artificial equality, which is literally constructed in a space uh, with other people in conversation, if you like. So Arendt's criticism of human rights um, starts from, well, I'll just give you snippets of this, but there are certain things that I think are very like important, at least like to show what is at stake, is again coming from her own her own understanding of politics or the political and. For Arendt, the existence or reality of politics or the political does not inhere in the particular human being. Rather, she argues that politics or the political exists only in so far as it exists between human beings. So following this, if it, were, if it was Marx who decidedly announced and urged that philosophy become this worldly, then it is Arendt who actually responded to this, to this urgency. And Arendt's response lies in how she takes up the question of recognition by showing the problem with the notion of universal equality of the human beings in the abstract. So, but what does she have to offer us? So, in the origins of totalitarianism, she states, and I quote a little extensively, because I think it's a beautiful one, we became aware of the existence of a right to have rights, and this means to live in a framework where one is judged by one's actions and opinions, as well as the right to belong to some kind of organized community, only when millions of people emerged who had lost and could not regain these rights because of the new global political situation. So this is the statement where her conception of a right to have rights makes its first appearance, and she does not merely assert that this right to, right, right to have rights exists, but that we became aware of its existence. So coming from our end, this is not just a colloquial or like, you know, light use of we, but this we points to a voice through which the voicing of the concerns of the children of enlightenment, if you like, uh, there becomes a we. And this is going back to, I think I have to point this out, because this is a very, one of my favorite texts still, I think, to this day, Kant's, um, what is like a question, an answer to the question, what is enlightenment, which he starts with um, the exit from men's, or like the human being's self incurred tutelage is, what is it? The, the, uh, the enlightenment is the, exit from men's self-incurred tutelage. Uh, but tutelage is, um, has, like, comes from, he says, uh, in German, which is like tutelage and immaturity, but it also comes from moon, so like mouth. So, I think, could be understood also as a lack of voice or like being not able to, 
not being able to speak one's mind, so to speak. Um, so yeah, that's the little slight uh, remark. So Arendt says that this right to have rights can only be guaranteed by humanity itself, but then she says this may not even be possible. But I want to understand this to be possible, and I want to think of this humanity as a, not just as a metaphysical principle of humanity, but a, as the concrete togetherness of human beings, as a concrete appearance, so to speak. So it pertains to a decision, if you like, of appearing together. And this is why I think it becomes a performance as well, because it implies this decision of stepping into a space. But it will, we'll see that it becomes intersubjective and reciprocal in a certain sense. Um, so what Arendt talks about in the origins, again, the decline of the nation state and the end of the rights of men, is that we became also aware that after all the um, propaganda and all the, the, the rise of totalitarianism, the existence of internment and uh, concentration camps, that no such thing as inalienable human rights existed. So, so to speak, the, uh, the work that these rights needed to do could not be done. And why is this the case? Like, what is lacking here? Are there not human beings who actually need this sort of recognition or who actually have these rights just by virtue of being human? Uh, this is a problem. So, this is also the, um, the part at which, well, she doesn't only do this in the origins, but she also talks about the problem of the rights of men in, on revolution, where the rights, where these human rights rest on literally the rights to, so the, the men's natural rights, and I quote upon the new body politic after the French Revolution, uh, was supposed to rest upon man's natural rights, upon his rights in sober as he's nothing but a natural being, upon his right to food, dress, and the reproduction of the species, that is upon this, his right to the necessities of life. And these rights were not understood as pre-political rights that no government and no political power had the right to touch or violate, but as the very content as well as the ultimate end of government and power. So the way in which these natural rights were put forth was in order to literally constitute the body politic. And this again becomes problematic but there, because there is no sort of motivational factor, motivational force for these rights to be um, exercised or granted in certain situations. So what I want to suggest is that the human, these human rights, um, or the well, while she contends that human rights as inalienable rights, grounding the concept of humanity becomes an aporia, she argues that there is a right to have rights, and I want to show that this pertains to the condition of visibility, like a very concrete visibility. And this visibility has a, so to speak, ontological grounding in human dignity, where this dignity enables us to recognize someone as a particular individual bearing a social identity in the first place. Um, and this ontological grounding could be understood, because we'll probably have this discussion, it is not just the ontological grounding of the human being as the initiator of action or as the beginning, uh, as being a capacity for a new beginning, but the very urge to appear, and how this urge to appear can be understood in, a, in, a, in an intersubjective space, so to speak. So it is not just ontological in the sense that it defines us, but it may define us as long as we're willing to grant the sort of right to have rights to each other. So in Arendt's words, um, quote, the fundamental deprivation of human rights is manifested, fir manifested first and above all in the deprivation of a place in the world which makes opinions significant and actions ineffective, uh, actions effective, end quote. This place is the space in which we appear to one another and become equal. For equality is not a natural phenomenon of, exist of human existence. It can only be understood in artificial terms, which apply to a certain space in which politics happens, so to speak. And Arendt beautifully explains, explains this saying, equality in contrast to all that is involved in mere existence is not given to us, but is the result of human organization, insofar as it is, guide, insofar as it is guided by the principle of justice. And again, this is one of the worldly principles, like of 
that we share in our in-between. Um, we're not born equal, we become equal as members of a group on the strength of our decision to guarantee ourselves mutually equal rights. Our political life rests on the assumption that we can produce equality through organization because men can act in and change and build a common world together with as equals and only with as equals. And in a sense, I don't know if you ever did this, but I, in the first version of this paper, there were all these like six, because like he, she always says his, and Marx always says his, or like him, men. I think this is more pertaining to, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, Thomas, but because it's coming from the German, like just mensch, like just men, or is it, I don't think she wants to like to endorse like a sexist language, but oh well, that's, you know, again, a sign, it's just I want to say that. Uh, so what we understand from the above passage is that equality is experienced spatially. And this means that those who do not have a place in community, quote, lack that tremendous equalizing of differences which comes from being citizens of some commonwealth, and yet, since they're no longer allowed to partake in the human artifice, they begin to belong to the human race in much, as, in much the same way as animals belong to a specific animal species. So you become undifferentiated, you become sort of homogenized, you become unidentified. Yeah. So, what I want to say on top of this is that, and I think I may be like two more minutes if I do, um, this is, there, for those of you who've read the paper, there are parts at which I go against certain readings, um, not because I don't disagree with them, I just want to show something else, but for instance, to take uh, Peg Birmingham's suggestion as the, the right to have rights to be more than a merely juridical right, she still argues that it is a fundamental political right, it is the right to belong to significantly to a political space. I think this demarcation between juridical and political rights becomes telling in the context of trying to appropriate how the political differs for our and for merely institutionalized political practices. So it does demonstrate the novelty of Arne's project in comparison to Marx's critique of juridical political rights, uh, but still the political deeming that a right to have rights is just is a political right does not give us the or does not give us readily the extra in, institutional or the spatial or performative aspect of this right and not every space or like not every public space is a political space by definition although a public space has the possibility of becoming a political space on the condition of the questions that are raised in that space by the plurality of human beings who are gathered there so for instance this is a public space in so far as we appear here, you know, together. But it's not necessarily a political space unless we start, well, unless we all start talking probably when I stop talking, which will happen, I promise. <laughs> but what I'm trying to say is that it's just, it's not just a political right or it's not just the moral imperative in the sense of me, in the sense of going back to my own humanness, so to speak, and recognizing that I owe this to another person because of their because of a certain quality of them. It really becomes just performative in the sense of it has to have well it happens in that space and if we're to have this sort of um, recognition it, it has I have to grant that person their visibility um, so that we can have a discussion. So the space so the now the last part space of recognition um, is actually where I talk about, this is where I'll skip the, the philosophy part, so to speak, and come maybe to the example that I'm giving. Um, so visibility, again, coming to the visibility in the space, um, denotes what reality consists of, according to Aaron's account, and because for her, reality is what appears in a space, and so far as it can, it, it is what can appear to others. And she states in the human condition, quote, to be deprived of the space means to be deprived of reality, uh, which humanly and politically speaking is the same as appearance. So I will clarify this point, like how this connects to the right to have rights, briefly by explaining the uh, Roboski airstrike or massacre that took place in Turkey. So on December 28, 2011, the Turkish Air Force accidentally killed 34 Kurdish people at the border. Um, and here, what is officially a border between two countries becomes a social and political boundary, so to speak, between two peoples in one land. And this is due to the incompatibility between the granting of political rights by the state and the concrete recognition of individuals as a performative phenomenon. So the equal rights that are granted to the citizens 
by the, by the state remain insufficient in rendering an equality of the code's visibility in public space. And again, this public space does not have to be a properly political space. Um, in turn, the kind of violence purported against the Kurdish villagers stems from the instrumental framework of politics inscribed in the homogenous and universal abstraction of the citizen of a self-identified nation state. So what happened here is that the, you know, the interests of the two parties did not coincide. So they were already, there was this understanding of the person as a, well, in this case it was the the Kurd appearing or being hyper visible, so to speak, as a terrorist, uh, which made their destruction possible, even if accidentally. So, and this, I think, is the is what covers over the Kurds' visibility with regard to their ethnic identity of Kurdishness and deems them invisible as possible political agents in the public sphere. So, if the Kurd or, or Turk or the Armenian or whoever, the woman, the housewife is not recognized in her social identity, that is, if her whiteness is not recognized, she cannot appear in the political space, and this amounts to dismissing her very right to have rights, the right to appear, which is connected to her visibility. So what I claim is, then, this recognition of one's social identity allows for the possibility of visibility in public space, I, and this visibility is what gives us the condition of the possibility of hearing and being willing to listen to them or the other that we recognize. Given this, this, this disclosure of the disclosure of one's who-ness, one's own unique identity, which is the properly political identity for Hannah Arendt, uh, can only be understood meaningfully when one can appear in political space. And this disclosure entails a being with others, like a human togetherness that is not about being for or against others, so to speak. So what has been argued so far shows that the condition of visibility can manifest itself in different extremes, like as hypervisibility, which turns into invisibility, or as mere visibility that remains abstractly grounded on an abstract equality of human beings before the law. For instance, again, the courage uh, loses the possibility of manifesting your political agency, which can only present itself in a political space, in the plurality of human togetherness. Similarly, and I think this may be more close to home for us, similarly, a, a homeless person, for instance, who's hyper-visible, as homeless, becomes merely visible, so that her dignity becomes concealed. One's appearance in the political space, then, is not a natural phenomenon, but can only be manifested by a principle of humanity, which I understand as the human dignity that is granted in the recognition of one's visibility. So without going, or like, not dismissing the natality aspect, but still going to a very concrete understanding of how we appear in space, so to speak. And the foundation of this human dignity is neither natural nor historical, and this is the point of transformation in the discourse of rights. So, regarding this shift in the discourse of humanity in the 19th century, Aaron states that the new situation in which humanity has an effect assumed the role formally ascribed to nature or history would mean in this context that the right to have rights or the right of every individual to belong to humanity should be guaranteed by humanity itself. While well, Aaron contends that humanity as a regular idea could not and did not in fact do this work. But what if we understand humanity to refer to a human condition in which we appear to others in our singularity or givenness? So the givenness of the human being, the differences that individuals have, does not give us <clears throat> an inequalizing force of these differences on their own. But only insofar as one can be understood as having an identity, a social one, can one be understood to have this, to be recognized to have this right to have rights. And the recognition of the visibility of an agent who can partake in political discourse then should be understood as a common concern of all. And this, I do not say this lightly, so to speak, because a common concern is mostly understood in the framework of politics for her, where we act, where we, ha where we have concerted, con concerted action for a common concern, a common worldly concern, so to speak. But what I'm trying to suggest is that while this recognition of visibility of the social identity remains pre-political, or like, remains public but not properly political, it still gives us that step of a, the, like, if you like, the condition of possibility of appearing in a political space. So it still has a force, and, and I think it's an important one. And this is the point at which the another principle comes in, and this will be the end, and this will, I can hopefully tie up with the equal ability that I talked about at the beginning. There is this principle of courage, 
uh, for our end, and for I think we can all agree with that one. There needs to be some courage in order to enter a public or political space. You, you need to step outside your door, or whatever. Go go out into the world, or like publish your stuff, get it you know trashed by other people. You know, there's some courage involved in these things. Um, but one is so the recognition demands work or rather it demands courage, but one is, like, one is not simply visible in so far as one can be seen, but only in so far as one can be seen as an individual worthy of having a right to have rights. And this courage reveals not only the dignity of the <coughs> human being, but also her vulnerability. So the human being is vulnerable in so far as she's not just an abstract citizen, he's equal, who's equal to others before law. However, it is this very vulnerability that gives us the recognition of the right to have rights as an imperative, which is at once a performative. Like. So I think at this point we've gone beyond what Arendt has given us in her formulation of the right to have rights, understood as the right to membership in a community, for we have shown the possibility of how this membership can be performed, so to speak. Um, and in turn, or like in the end, I claim that we understand, like with a sense of urgency, uh, we understand recognition with and beyond what Arendt has offered us that is recognition as an imperative that pertains to this right, which is granted by the visibility in public or political and or political space. And as we see in many cases, the ones that I've talked about in others, recognition cannot remain an abstract phenomenon, nor can misrecognition simply be understood as a lack of human rights. Only when we can understand the right to have rights in terms of the performance of visibility can we actually empower certain invisible parties, and hence they can recover their world-creating capacity, wherein they can manifest their freedom in the plurality of others. And that will be all. And I'm sure that was much more than 10 minutes. Thank you for bearing with me. <laughs>
matters. But most of the time, I think, it does depend on this civil right, or if you like civil recognition, or this like first stage of recognition, uh, which I prefer to be, like maybe like, a, like the recognition of one's social identity, so that you can, I don't want to say safely exactly, but then you can actually mm, practice this, your action, um, in a way that will maintain some meaningfulness. So with the Gezi Park, for instance, it was this protest happened uh, in 2000, like last summer in Istanbul, and then like whatever they they were prevalent in like many cities in Turkey, is that where people got together, many different people in their plurality, and they actually I think they I think that was a very nice example of our anti-political action. But what happened, and I even. I can even say that it was maybe an Arantine revolution, just by way of, you know, we were talking about a new beginning, you know, in a very hopeful way. Uh, but I think what happened, and this is the part I think I wouldn't push about the civil aspect of the right to have rights, is that the police brutality or the police violence proved to be so outrageous that many people died in these protests. And like, you know, they didn't need to become martyrs. I don't, yeah, well, yeah. Um, so, what is happening, what, what, what I'm saying is that the, these people were not recognized by the sort of state agents or the government agents to be able to practice the sort of like very basic human right of appearing, of appearing in public and acting with a common concern about literally reclaiming a public space because these spaces are public, parks are public, or like schools are public. Um, so I think that's why I want to push it. Like I agree with you in saying, like I agree with you when you say that it's not just like a right to life, but maybe we can say that. I don't know if we can say it, but let's try. Do you try. want recognition to be a human right, or is it okay to have it be a political or civil right? I guess is what I'm. Oh, recognition itself. I think I still. I don't know if I want recognition to be a right, but I want to say that this recognition has to be performed in order for us to understand this. This human right, this one human right that she talks about. Mm -hmm. um, so this is the, I think, the the sort of money part because it cannot be a right. And and this is so. These were the questions that I got last time. It's and I make I, I made it clear for that audience at the beginning that this is not about rights uh, in the sense of like duties and obligations because it's you know it's it's not going to have that moral or like legal framework so to speak. But just understanding this sort of. Um, or just performing it in, in space, in public with others, gives us a meaningful, or the possibility of a meaningful existence. So maybe it's not about living, but if we want to go back, we can say maybe <coughs> living well. Like, it's the way in which you can live well. And I think Aaron would have understood it in a political way, uh, <coughs> as belonging to a political community. I don't, know if, I, I don't know if that satisfies you for now, but... It's, I'm going to let other people intervene, yeah. and then... We can always circle back to it. Thank you. Can I follow up on yeah. uh, Roger's question? Yeah. Uh, to just push you a little bit further of on that. Of course. Because uh, in the example you give of these protests, it's still the, the, the Turkish government whom you want to re you want them to recognize these protesters, right? Yeah. So is 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 ultimately what's at stake for you um, government recognition of the rights of people to appear? Uh, speak and act in public, or is something else at stake? Uh, and this also relates to your um, first part of the paper about the Jewish question. Yeah. Because are you presenting your argument as a solution to something that Marx uh, does not uh, even see as a problem, but that you see as a problem? Because the whole point for Marx is that we need to get rid of the state, we need to get rid of um, that kind of political recognition because yeah. that has nothing to do with exactly. uh, the true freedom that we need or the true interhuman recognition, if you want to call it that, yeah. uh, that Marx uh, calls um, true human emancipation. Exactly. No, it's that's again a beautiful question. No, of course it's not just that. Like uh, in the examples, I think it comes out like that. But I also want to say that this actually, again, it's about space. So, like, I don't know, this is going to be mere speculation. I'll come back to the Marx part. but. The way in which we, I think something is lost, and we saw this in Chile as well, like, you know, we've seen this at many other places, but when there are people 
protesting, like individual human beings protesting, and there's like, let's say, the police force. So in that sense, it's not just like this abstract government not recognizing the people, but the police like literally sharing this space with these people, just thinking that these people are dangerous and hence eliminable, is not granting them their the right to have rights. But coming back to the government stuff, yes, Marx does say, I mean, and I agree with Marx, but we'll come, well, so Marx says that the political rights are not enough because they, you know, in here in the whatever rights of the citizen, which is about the egoistic individual, and this is not going to give us any equality. This but they're not just not enough, they're actually counterproductive, right, or they're actually standing in the way of uh, yeah. true interview and commensive. Uh, exactly, exactly. Well, they're just like a one step. One step forward in the right way, maybe, and then we'll historically speaking, exactly, and then yeah. we'll get and then we'll get rid of it. So like I yeah, have yeah, yeah. I have that part in the paper as well. I'm like, yes, there's this revolutionary praxis. I'm not going to go into it, but so the thing is that, and this is I was just reading actually her his um, some letters um, that appear in formats. Uh, he because I think he sees uh, political or politics to be mainly about like state domination. This is why I think well for him we need to do away with this sort of structure. But I think for him too, there could be a possibility of um, political action or political space in the Arendtian sense if we pushed it enough. Like I'm, I'm not pushing it at the moment because I don't think like with a not the fault, but what is wanting in I think Marx's um, account is again this understanding of the individual as having the possibility of having public rights or, or, or practicing them in public because he will understand political rights and I mean I have it in the in the quotes and stuff that these political rights are exercised in the community in a political community with others but political community for him rests solely on this domination like between the ruler and the rule so this is why we want to do away with it so I don't know if he has actually himself because he has a social universal human being yes the Gattungsweisen beautiful but I don't know if he has the public understanding of the human being, like the public agent, that is not merely the productive, you know, agent, that is not merely the social agent, you know, who has overcome or like, you know, if we, um, one day overcome like the commodity fetishism, so to speak. Um, does that, mm -hmm. does that make sense? Yeah. Questions? Maybe I'll, maybe I'll just ask a little bit about what Mikhail just said. I mean, are you yeah. asking for the government? I think this is, I think, the force of this question, if I understood it correctly. Mm -hmm. Are you asking for the government to enforce human rights? Or is or are human rights to be enforced by, or to be claimed by the people themselves? I don't know if that was the force of his question, but it struck me that it was. Yeah. I mean, in the sense that if we ask the government to enforce human rights, then, then the rights are political rights, yeah. uh, or civil rights in the sense of... of of, of Marx and yeah. our end, but we are also taking agency away from the people as as, exactly. as, as, as political actors. Yeah. Um, so, you know, our end says that when we ask and beg for human rights to be enforced, we put we make human rights different from the society against cruelty to animals. Yeah. Uh, and but her claim is that human rights have to be claimed as humans. Yeah. And thus acted upon. So I'm yeah. wondering. You know, your example, and I think Mikhail was pushing on this, is suggest that you want the state to give you <coughs> rights, which I think is not exactly her, her no, position. No, no, and yeah, and again, actually, to well, clarify further, um, no, it's not just that, or it's not that, like, I, um, I, I do not want to assert that this, so let's say that this, the right to have rights should appear in the Constitution or something, <laughs> that's just, that would be... That, that would not work. I mean, that, that would not do any work. That we would just fall back into the same, like, primacy of rights discourse. We're all, we all have these rights. We're all equal before law. But that doesn't do work. But I think the reclaiming, or claiming them, claiming of this right by the human beings is what I'm trying to suggest by saying that it's a performance. But the problem is that, like, and I, I use this language, I say it's an imperative, but I don't want to say it's an, an imperative that just falls on me at all times, but only in spaces in which I am with others uh, or one is with others so you can then come with the come up with the example of like and I have this example and oh, one of my professors asked me well, how about the hermit you know living in his whatever cottage or wherever hermits live in the mountain like how do you recognize this okay 
how, how do we recognize the right of like right to have rights of the hermit? It's like I cannot just go knock on his door and tell like, hi, by the way, you have a right to have rights. So like, cheers. That is not exactly what I'm saying. It's just again like leaving people with their own agency, but then also trying to show that just by way of falling back on the abstract, like on the on the civic or like political rights that we have, does not do the work. Uh, for living together, like for existing together. Um, I think mostly when I, for instance, when I'm teaching both Hobbes and then the transition from Hobbes to Arendt, like the, the, the one of the questions that I ask my students is like, how, how do you think, or like, how much of a public agent are we when we step into the, the subway with our like, you know, earphones plugged in and like we're just, you know, either reading something or like checking our smartphones. And we have no idea about what's going on, like, around us. Like, we would not notice if somebody felt, I mean, maybe if there was, like, a big thing happening, we would notice. But these are, like, for instance, public spaces, like metros or, like, stations. We, we appear in public a lot. But I don't think we assume this sort of public appearance, or we don't see ourselves as publicly appearing, or other people's as publicly appearing, because we're, we all want to, sort of, that give them their privacy and their, you know, rights to be liberated from, like, other people. And I think there needs to be more of a, more of a response, again, this ability to respond to, to your surroundings or to the world around you. And I think that is an urgency. Like, I... <laughs> the, the, the fly could not appear in No, 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 that was a wet. Oh. Oh. That would not have killed the fly. Um, but yeah, so I think I want to say that it should be reclaimed by the people themselves, but I don't want to say that now go and reclaim it, or like claim it, because you have to. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think, and this, I'll take this from our end, but I think in order to be, in order to have a properly, um, properly human, or properly political, or public existence, you have to do this. Um, okay, yeah. Is there a... Yeah. Yeah. Question. Um, so... Um, so I understood the paper correctly. Um, one thing you talk about is how like the stripping of like civil political rights sort of facilitates the stripping of human rights. Like when you're talking about putting people in like hermit camps during yeah. World War II. Yeah. But then you go into the part with visibility and yeah. talking about like how when people are seen as like sort of the marked category, mm -hmm. that also it dehumanizes them. So when you talk about visibility and performance. Are you talking about the civic, like the political, or are you talking about the human right? Um, that's just something I was seeing. Sure. Do, do you have an example? Because I can speak to the example better maybe. I think I'm talking about both, so like that's okay. why I think it's like there are two stages, right? which I again, there, I, I skipped the first three introductory pages, mm -hmm. but there's like, so there was this very bold claim, because I like making bold claims, but that being seen, because Arendt always talks about being seen and heard by others as mm -hmm. this like, you know, condition of appearing in a public space or like doing political action. And I think we just take it for granted. Like we just never question this assumption. Mm -hmm. Like what is being seen and heard? And I think there are two levels of this, mm -hmm. uh, being, being seen and heard. Which one is like, one is the social uh, level where you are seen and heard in the social space or, mm -hmm. or pre-political public spaces. And then there's the political level. Um, so I think I want to speak to both. Oh, okay. And in the one sense, so like, again, there are parts that I, I mean, for instance, I am a citizen of the Republic of Turkey, so like, that is one identity, social identity that I have. I'm a woman philosopher, that is another one. And these need recognition, or like, these demand a sort of recognition for me to be able to then enter any sort of political debate, is what I'm trying to say. Can I ask another yeah. as well? Is, is, is it not your speech that needs to be heard? in public and your action needs to be seen yeah rather than you as an actor or speaker yes but then you also want to give that person their sort of self-identified identity and not just dismiss it according to you or is it our because i want to i want to say that i want to say that we can have it in our and she never talks about it Right, because she focuses on on, on the political speech, exactly rather than on the person yeah. with dignity and yeah because that seems to be Kind of a conscient import in, in, into her more. Um, yeah, and that's why that's why I said um, that's that's why I said dignity should be understood by way of visibility, not I just. I'm not sure I understand what you mean, though. 
Really? I mean, if, if I act and I put a sculpture into the town or I drop a drop flyers into the town, I may not be my body may not be visible, but I'm visible. I mean, in what I'm doing, I'm impactful. Okay, and that's so I'm not the sure that matters. Well, so you're. I mean, I'm just trying to understand your question. I'll let I'll let Jazz. No, but go like it's not the all like there is no ultimate mattering, so to speak. I think that's the question. It's yeah, I, I mean, I don't have an objection. I'm just raising this as an open question. Yeah, so I think so. The way in which I understand it is, um, and again, this goes back to the trying to understand this sort of recognition in extra institutional senses as well. So like we're we're not just you know I mean of course we're always governed by laws, but not every space is like a political space um, or in the sense of an institution sort of political space. Uh, but what I want to say is that this sort of um, this sort of public space in which I can be recognized by my social identity becomes pertinent or it becomes crucial to then being recognized in my or like the possibility of acting in a political way. Uh, so if I if I am invisible in one manner, let's say that I don't know I'm a housewife and I'm just not visible, like both because I'm at home, which is not the case luckily anymore, uh, but I also, if I'm just seen as that in a certain sense, and not as a, as an equal, as a peer, so to speak, that can ha that can appear in pop uh, in political discourse, then I think that becomes problematic. So that way of recognizing the housewife or whatever, whoever, I think becomes crucial in actually letting them in the into the political discourse. That totally puzzles you more. The, who has the question? Who has a follow up? I think, and, uh, I think we might have the same question, but yeah. your claim that um, social identity should be recognized in public space. I mean, certainly, in, in, um, as you know, uh, the social is something non-political. Mm -hmm. So I don't really understand why you would make that claim. I mean, it's about wanting to be recognized as a citizen among other citizens, right? So why would you want to be recognized in your social identity? As uh, would you say, a housewife, a woman, um, you certainly don't want certain categories to be excluded. I understand yeah. that part, but I, yeah, I just don't understand why you use that term of social identity because that's cer certainly not our end here. No, it is. It is not, and uh, that. But I still want to say that it's like a hidden premise. <laughs> like it, it is actually there. So I think the force of it comes from. Uh, first of all, I'm not just saying that it is as citizens that we should. For instance, I'm not a citizen here, like for instance, uh, and it no, never has, to, it doesn't have to be always within this framework of like being granted certain rights mm -hmm. uh, by the by the state. Uh, but surely the the way in which the way in which I want to understand this sociality or the uh, other identities is to make to make possible, like to sort of mm, put into place like the embodiment of the human being. Because it is not just, and I'm not trying to say, and I, I know that Arendt doesn't say this, and I never, like, I never would say it either. Like, it's, it's not about your interests being further. Like, I, I'm not saying that I should be heard as a certain social identity, hence that my interests should be satisfied. Or like all of my interests, singular or like collective interests, should be satisfied. So but it's not identity politics? No, it's not identity, no. That is not what I, like that is exactly what I'm trying to actually like go beyond or like I'm. Mean, Why then still use the term of social identity? Wouldn't it help to? Remember? Do you have a better one? Because I can well, use no, I don't, one. Well, I don't understand what's what's behind it. So, what do you, what do you want to be recognized exactly, in public space? Can I ask a question that might help or may not? You yeah. tell me if this is yeah. the answer you would give. Tell me. Which is when RN says I'm when I'm attacked as a Jew, I respond as a Jew. There are times when I have to take my social identity as a Jew, or as a woman, or as a housewife, because it's politically relevant, mm -hmm. and be recognized for that in the public sphere. Mm -hmm. And when I give my Sunny Lecture Acceptance Prize in Copenhagen, Copenhagen, yeah, uh, I come to Europe as a Jew, not as an American, not as a citizen. Mm -hmm. There are times when my social identity has to have political relevance, and I have to have the right and the confidence and the courage to enter the political in my social identity. Is that what you mean? Uh, yes, I agree with that, and I think it also goes back to the part where it's, so when I said that if the Kurd is not recognized in their whatness, they become pretty eliminable. Like 
it's a precarious life, so to speak. And I think that may be the other instance. So like, it's not just, but it, it, it is like giving, giving one the room or like the space to be able to speak for themselves. But isn't the problem precisely because they are merely seen as a what, namely as courts, that they are not recognized in, in yeah. public? Uh, Rather than as a yes. unique, distinct who, it, as she, well, she makes this. Well, yeah, but what I'm trying to say is that they're not even recognized as that. They're recognized falsely most of the time as terrorists. Well, or as terrorists, but it's also what. Well, what is a what is a unique, distinct who? A who has to be at some point. I'm a Kurd or I'm a Jew, right? With yeah, well, and then the common concern. It's unique and distinct. Can happen. Um, well. Not as an certainly not as an as an individual. The question is how abstract is an individual for our end? I mean, I think that for our end. Well, it's very important. concrete. Yeah, I think yeah. so too. Which is why I think there's always I think Yas is. I, mean, I, I think it's it makes sense to to say that there are private yeah. and social yeah. identities that we have to be able to bring into the public sphere. Yeah. Which doesn't mean ever that the public sphere should discriminate amongst those identities. In fact, I mean, in, in, in a, that the public sphere has to treat them as equals. But they're, they're relevant, I think, in the public sphere. Yeah, and it is, I think, it is this sort of, again, going back to the, the notion like that I use. And I, I'm not the only one, I just discovered this, artificial equality. <laughs> it was used by, uh, I think, Jeremy Waldron. Uh, anyway, but it's this sort of artifice, or like, how do we understand each other to be equal? Because obviously, it's, I mean, we're not equal naturally, and this is not just our end, I think many of us can agree to this point, uh, but the idea that if I'm just going to be equal in a political space, then I don't know what happens to the rest of my existence. Because for instance, I am not really a political actor myself, and I, I mean, I just, you know, I, I like teaching. Like that's where my public, it's not even political, but sorry, well, that's where my public stakes are at. And I still want to be able to meaningfully talk about how this public space still can um, give us or like um, foster the conditions of plurality and equality. And that was directly out of my teaching statement. <laughs> Thomas? I think Thomas and then yeah. I was just wondering Sort of a follow-up, but less, but less concrete. So if you can just skip it if you uh, mm -hmm. think it doesn't help the, the, the conversation. What's the what's the category of, of, of judgment whether something uh, is a matter of recognition of political recognition for you or not? Mm -hmm. Since we talked about s social uh, um, um, social identities being one, mm -hmm. but then there's also uh, speaking and acting being uh, uh, one you, you mentioned, and there is this uh, this space that creates something that, that Arendt suggests uh, uh, as a space of appearance of the political, which is then uh, closely tied to freedom, which would yeah. be another term coming in. Yeah. Uh, at other moments you talk about an imperative that has to be recognizable, in, uh, that has to be present in a way that we talk about um, a politically relevant uh, moment of recognition. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so my question is, so what's, what's, what's the categories to, to judge whether something is a, a relevant as a, as a case of political recognition? Um, so I think for that I'll just have to go, well, for that I'll just fall back to like um, Arendt's understanding of political action and how it's differentiated from mere, um, so to speak, movements, which we see a lot of in even our current politics. Uh, so the way in which, I don't know if this will you know, respond, but I'll try. So the way in which we can understand political action for her is by way of um, the common concern that we have, that we share, that, that is the in-between, or like that makes up the in-between, so to speak. And, you know, there's, there's been many criticisms leveled against this. It's like, what, what about the social question? So the thing is that she never, uh, I don't think, said uh, the social question is out of it. But the question, or the judgment, or the standard is different. So when we're talking about political action, we have these worldly political principles and political virtues, so to speak, as she calls them, uh, that are at stake or that are in operation. 
and that is the way with which to judge that sort of action. So it's not about the utility or the success of the outcomes, which would be the generalization of the instrumental mentality of the fabricator, which is the problem that she identified very clearly in the human condition, saying that this is the, the what we don't want is the generalization of the fabrication experience or the instrumentality, because then we lose meaning, like a meaningful existence, meaningful human existence, if we start judging by these standards. So I don't know how the judgment would happen, but it would happen in the way in which we um, construct or create a meaning, or if you like, produce a meaning in a creative sense, and try to maintain it. And that would... Uh, that would happen in action itself. So I can, I can give it. I can try to give an example, and this is in the epilogue of the origins of totalitarianism, where she quotes actually this uh, woman uh, student um, who partook in the Hungarian Revolution, and it, it is it is beautiful. It's what she was saying, and I'll just paraphrase. I mean, this summer, but that what we were fighting for was truth and freedom. Like they, we didn't want lies, but they had lost their capacity to meaningfully exist together because everything was covered over by lies, and they were fighting for truth and freedom, which I think could be understood by way of principle of the principle of justice, principle of equality, principle of public freedom. So that's the way to judge it. That's the way to recognize or understand that action. But again, I don't know if this again responds to your question. I don't know if I'm giving you what you want, but. I, I don't know what you had in mind when you said like the what sort of judgment, but yeah, I, I, you know we have different we we discuss different sort of entities who would be the entities of of, of this act of mm -hmm. recognition that yeah. is one of the centers of her uh, of her paper. The state yeah. was one that we discussed. The public in yeah. a way was one. Other citizens would be another. Yeah. But we have not yet discussed the legal code being yeah. a, a, a site of recognition. Yeah. So it was basically, a, I was trying to, to, to picture, to understand when for you does this um, uh, act of, of recognition actually sort of cross the line from the shade to the, I, to the visible. And, yeah. um, probably one has to speak, I mean you're responding in examples. Uh, talk about it with regard to the specific examples mm -hmm. in a less generalizing way. Uh, and so for yeah, it's more cla trying to clarify what my, I what think the would, intention of my question was rather than a follow-up question. Yeah, I think I think it would depend on the principles in which, like, or the principles that we find in certain spaces or acts, but um, I don't have a general theory about that. Um, yeah, I have a question. I, I just want to clarify because I was late, and the first okay. sentence I heard from you is that um, you said Marx, his understanding of human rights is um, kind of like on an individualist level, is like about domination and ruling. So, uh, I just want you to clarify that because okay. yeah. if you think about the example of like the class level, uh -huh. like the proletariat, like working in this factory being exploited, they are definitely visible to each other, they definitely appear to each other in such a both public and political space. And the the way that we, they recognize they recognize themselves and each other is definitely a, a um it's definitely happening within a political community. So I, I don't know why you say this is like... Yeah, I think there are a couple words missing, but you okay. have the gist, so I'll just, just fill in the, the words that are missing. So it is his criticism of human rights as standing or resting upon this understanding of the individual egoistic man. So when he talks about the, the Declaration of the Rights of the Man and the Citizen, which are, again, for the rights of man, it is liberty, um, liberty, equality, I, I don't know my declaration as well. And the right to exist. Property, the right to exist, security, <laughs> and equality, and then the the political rights, so to speak. With what he's saying is that these political rights uh, rest upon ultimately the rights of the the, the man, the individual uh, person, so to speak, which is itself based upon an inherent inequality, because it is about the sort of again this egoistic individual or. That, that's the word he used, but it's this individual, possessive individual uh, who 
has wants, certain wants and desires, and you want who can choose between the means to satisfy them. And as we all know, and this is no news, that the means are not, like, nobody talked about the social equality about the means. Lefebvre have this, Lefebvre, however you say his name, uh, has this The Coming of French Revolution, where he talks about, actually, the people who are writing this, they, they, they maintained it, like, they, they, they just let it be vague enough so that people would not ask about the social aspect <coughs> of this equality. So that is his criticism. And I agree with you that this sort of, um, so, that, so to speak, like the, the struggle or the unity amongst workers in you know, trying to achieve their ends does denote a sense of uh, community. But the thing is that the way in which you understand, and this is the second, pertaining to the second part of the sentence that you caught, the way in which he understands political is by way of the state apparatus, so the straight structure which is aimed at domination. So it is not how people uh, organize themselves, or like it's not about how people live together, and, but the thing is that it's still the case that they cannot, <coughs> those people are not properly or like, yeah, properly human in the sense that they cannot um, manifest their productive capacities in the way in which that, you know, we would like them to. And this is the difference between, and this is like, there's a, a long, pages and pages of whatever, explication about how this um, political emancipation is different from human emancipation. Human emancipation remains, again, a very, uh, am, like, not ambiguous, but it's, it's a, <laughs> there's a beautiful explanation of it, but it's like, we don't know what it looks like, because we have, we don't have it yet for Marx. And my assumption, or like my contention was that even if we have it, and I think it's a, you know, it's a good way to direct ourselves, so to speak, but even if we have it, I don't know if we could have a political community or political action in the way in which Aaron proposed that we could have. Because uh, then the struggle would be overcome. And I don't know how that existence would look like if we just took political to mean domination and rule, about, like, rule over others, so to speak. Um, I, I think I had. Uh, We're gonna. We'll have the last two questions. Okay, last two. The burning questions. <laughs> it, it's still unclear to me, or at least I want to be convinced. Um, Let me. And I'm wondering if anyone else has an impression. I'm not sure what the Marx is doing in the type. <laughs> I mean, because where you get to, I don't really think that. It's, I mean, so Marx is providing something inadequate, but then you also want to say there's something valuable to his criticism. <laughs> But it seems to me that what you extract out of that, out of Marx, is is fully negative, and uh, you get to where you're going, which is like a space of recognition, <coughs> without having Marx in there at all. Um, and in, in fact, it would be a more direct route. Yeah. And. Um, okay. No, I mean. <laughs> no, I'll, no. Not to say that there's nothing not... valuable in Marx, but for your for your. I'll, yeah, I have a yeah, I have a response to that. So this paper has. As people who may who have read it uh, may have seen, is almost um, if 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 not a three in one, it's definitely a two in one paper. So yes, there are many more papers that can be that can come out of this, and many people have told me this. The and this is where the joke comes in for the for the video recording. I thought I would self censor better, but I will not. I just love my j dead German boys. So and Marx has to be there because not because because I love dead German boys, but. Marx, like the way in which I think I wanted to take up the notion of equality, it's like the way in which he criticizes, he gives us the criticism of human rights, or like the criticism of these political rights, is a very valuable criticism. And I just wanted to show, I think, maybe this is like, this is again like coming from that tradition, like very old school, like Germanialist training, that it's like, Arendt actually has more common grounds with Marx that maybe we recognize, or that maybe we see. And it's also, On the Jewish Question is really one of my favorite texts, and I really, I, it's, there's just so much in it that I thought I should have it. Because it is giving us something about understanding the declarations and about understanding existence. Hmm. I don't know if that will satisfy you, it's just, yeah. I'm and convinced that you care about Mark. I'm not <laughs> well, I, 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 so the equality, the equality part doesn't convince you? Well, I mean, the, the, the sense that we need, I mean, Marx's criticism of liberal political rights showing the inherent in, you know, inequality upon which they were founded. Yeah. Do we, do we really need Marx for that? I mean, 
Mark criticism, Marxist criticism is meant, I think, in some sense, uh, mm -hmm. Nancy Fraser's way, right, of, of motivating change. Yeah. But the kind of change or the kind of motion of action you have in mind yeah. is going in a non-Marxist direction. Yes. And so then, if Almost. if your if your idea of, of what's valuable about Marxist criticism is detached from what follows from Marxist criticism, it seems to me then then we really don't need Marx to go where you're going. To, to but that's another way of rephrasing the same question. Yeah. Two res <laughs> two respond like two quick responses. Maybe it's the way in which, again, as everybody has a has their own Hannah Arendt, everybody has their own Karl Marx, and I choose not to read them in this, uh, and that is also in the paper, in this like grandiose like materials determinist terms. So I don't think that I have to go that way. Right. I think he gives his his understanding of anthropology, and I, I think he gives us a, a lot of things. Um, to, to make sense of recognition. And it's a paper on recognition, so right. like that's why there's like the Hegel part, mm -hmm. and it's like, okay, what did Hegel not give us? And then, but what followed afterwards wasn't just that we're not equal, or we need a community, or like we need to go like a communitarian, or like a liberal route, because I could have just, you know, as you say, yes, I could have left, I mean, I don't think I could have left him out, and I really think it comes from like that criticism, like the force of the criticism, but I think just saying that Arendt does not think that equality in here is in nature, would have been just taking an assumption and utilizing it for my own terms, where I, whereas I wanted to argue for it. So I think it's a vehicle for my, like it's a, it, it gets my argument off the ground, but I, that's my opinion. I hope it does. Uh, yeah. As, as we sit here, there's a demonstration going on in Kingston in which the sheriff of Ulster County has decided to check the IDs of anybody entering into the social services office to obtain welfare benefits. Um, and nowhere else are IDs being checked in a systematic way. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, explanation is, is that uh, we may find people for whom warrants are outstanding. Um, this is being protested by a number of people who the sheriff has vowed to arrest if they persist in their protest. What they're protesting is the right, is the denial of the right of privacy by the sheriff of the people who receive uh, welfare benefits. I mention this only to say that I think that this turns marks on his head <laughs> and suggests that his critique of bourgeois rights uh, may meet an end point here where the people who are protesting are protesting in order to engage the rights of those who have been denied property in the social sense. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. I think we should um, call it a good day and thank Yaz and we can continue the conversation informally over lunch and cookies. So thank you very much, Yaz, for coming. Thank you.